Hello everybody, this is Michael Hollands once again for Sound of the Movies. Today I have the pleasure to be joined by two-time Oscar-nominated film editor Chris Levinson. Over the course of his long career, Chris has edited films such as Wolfen, Top Gun, Beverly Hills Cop 2, Days of Thunder, Midnight Run, The Enemy of the State, Gone in 60 Seconds, Edward, Crimson Tide, Con Air, Armageddon, Pearl Harbor, Batman Returns, Sleepy Hollow, Sweeney Todd, Revenge, Big Fish, Alice in Wonderland, Planet of the Apes, Deja Vu, Dark Shadows, Dumbo, Ghosted, and many more. It is my pleasure to welcome Chris Levinson. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time out of your schedule. I really appreciate that. So I'm looking forward to today's conversation and i'm sure you will have lots of stories to um, to share and thanks again for taking the time chris i know that many people say they got into this business by accident or by happenstance or of course they knew somebody who knew somebody who worked in the industry so how did it all happen for you i uh, didn't want to do anything conventional it, with my life. Uh, all my roommates in college are now lawyers, and that wasn't for me. And um, I was more of an internal person. You know, I used to draw and and um, and paint, and I was I was more introspective. So I found that um, I stumbled into editing as something that one could do for themselves. It was more of a myself in the canvas back then, so to speak. It's evolved into something much different with uh, many voices now in, in studio, large budget movies. But back in the day, it was a very individual kind of um, activity. But I started, I didn't know what I was doing really. I left art school and came down here. Um, my brother, who was a doctor, knew older brother by eight or nine years, knew the guys that made Woodstock because he he uh, was would hang around with rock and roll people. And uh, he, they were going to make another movie on the American Revolution for the bicentennial, 17, 1976. So I moved down here blindly and was kind of an assistant to these guys who lived in West Hollywood. And the movie never got made, but there was an editing machine there that Woodstock was edited on and I got to play with it at night. And um, I just was attracted to the whole process. What do you think is the essence of editing and filmmaking? You have worked on almost 40 pictures. Those films you worked on have grossed billions and billions of dollars. If you were to sum up your job and your thoughts on how you get the most out of a picture and the essence of editing, what would you tell me? Well, I um, I come from uh, the kind of movies where story is important. So th that's that was my training. And if I'm not following the narrative, I'm lost in the movie. So I'm always trying to track that um, in in what I do. And secondly, if you don't care about the characters, you're lost as well. So it's really caring about the characters and getting the story right. And then all the other stuff falls into place and it can be improved. We rely on such a collaborative medium that there's so many voices and so many efforts that go into movies, uh, thousands of decisions for you know, every foot of frame. And so it's it's uh, it's been a great process, and that that's how I start every movie is really like trying to get the story hammered out and then improve it from there. You've got a great resume. If anybody is not familiar with your body of work, which I doubt, because you've edited some of the most popular and successful films of the past decades. I mean, the list is really long. Great films. Uh, great action pictures also and in the 80s you start, started out very well i mean you had worked on wolfen for instance which is still one of one of my favorite pictures of uh, of the 80s and you had worked with uh, francis ford coppola 
also on um, The Outsiders and one from The Heart, for instance. You worked with uh, John Hughes on Weird Science. There was a lot going on. What do you think was your biggest takeaway from those early days and how did those days shape your career in any way or form? Well, they're all very different. You know, every one of those that you mentioned was a completely different experience. So it taught me to be very flexible and be a very um, good listener. I mean, actually, I was an assistant editor on The Outsiders and One from the Heart, even though it came after a Wolf in which I was started as assistant, but was promoted. Um, before that, though, I was kicking around in independent films um, a lot, uh, meaning movies that barely saw the light of day, but I got a great deal of experience on editing actually before I ever assisted. So uh, it was it was great training ground. I remember one director said, just make sure you use every angle. Uh, and I thought, oh, okay. So that was that was really good to try and wedge in every shot. And it taught me to look at a scene differently. Uh, and each one of those projects you mentioned did the same. They're completely different movies, different filmmakers, different visions. But it it got me to be able to adapt early on in my career to what was coming up. Financially speaking, or in terms of box office, one of the biggest hits of the 80s certainly was Top Gun. And it was directed by Tony Scott. You worked on the picture. Billy Weber was your co-editor. And as I understand, you and Billy had kind of a hard time to navigate through the picture because there was so much footage and there wasn't much of a story at first. And even also Bob Badamy, for instance, said that the job you and Billy did was fantastic and you, that you basically were also very much responsible for shaping the film to make it look the way it does today. Well, yeah, um, thank you for that. Uh, it was quite an experience. We had a lot of film, but not as much film as we do these days because it was actually shot on film. Uh, and they restricted Tony, I think, to one camera for what we called the ground story. But the aerial uh, photography, there were cameras everywhere. I mean, on mountains, in the in the cockpit, um, in, <laughs> in the pilot's point of views, everything. So uh that that was a that was a big help obviously but the story is it's true that the script was constantly changing and it was really hard to in the days before visual effects to actually shoot aerial scenes that would fit something written on a page uh the navy uh was was incredibly collaborative um their guys were in the cutting room helping us with dialogue would chase the written story and then the written story would conform to what we had available to us to edit. So it was a constant push and pull with the movie. It's almost like a documentary in that sense. You know, we had great producers. Tony was so collaborative. We terrific actors, obviously. Tom was the best. Uh, Kelly was gorgeous. You know, everything worked ultimately, but it went through, it went through a lot of phases, that movie. And, um, you know, we never thought it would be that kind of a big hit at all. You know, it's just you, you never know, especially back then. But we put our faith in the superstar producers, Don and Jerry, who up till that point had had major successes. Harold Faltermeyer said they called him the Golden Boys back then because the team of Simpson Bruckheimer could do no wrong up until a certain point. <laughs> Well, like all of us, I suppose. You can't bat a thousand, but um, no, they're, they, they, they've been great for my career, that's for sure. I've done 13 movies with Jerry. Yes, yes, that's that's an enormous amount. Very successful ones, and also some of my personal favorites also from the 80s, and of course, Beverly Hills Cup 2 also stands out. Um, also directed by Tony Scott, produced by Brockheimer and Simpson, and you also worked on this one with uh, with Billy Weber. And I think Beverly Hills Cup 2, for me personally, is one of the best sequels ever. Not just in terms of action films, 
in terms of film exper experience per se. Yeah, it was it was done very quickly. It was well written. Uh, Eddie was terrific. Um, and, you know, I'm glad to hear you. My, mine would be have to be Godfather 2. I disagree, but that's okay. I'm happy to hear that, Michael. Oh, no, I meant uh, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, compare Cop 2 to uh, The Godfather 2. Uh, <laughs> what, I, <laughs> what I was trying to say is that sequels tend to be worse than the original. And Beverly Hills Cop 2 certainly is a phenomenal sequel, which almost even surpasses the original. That's what I was trying to convey. Right. Well, I'm glad you, you think that. I mean, the, the first one I thought was was just spectacular and um it was and tony brought something different to the second one you know it was harder edged it was glossy he's very much into photography um eddie eddie carried the load with the comedy and the characters were all set which were established by marty brest really on the first one but um thank you for that yeah i think it was the highest grossing movie of that year and the prior year was top gun so don and jerry I don't know if anybody's ever done that. Any producers have had consecutive years of the highest grossing movies. They were really on a roll, which would kind of end with um, Days of Thunder because Paramount at that time canceled the production deal, which, which Simpson Bruckheimer had, and then they kind of parted ways. I mean, not Don and Jerry, but Paramount and Simpson and Bruckheimer. So because Days of Thunder really made a lot of money but it was an expensive film to make as i understand the film was also behind schedule and also over budget so how did this affect your work and how was it ultimately fixed well we had a, a set release date um and which was beyond the realm of feasibility really uh, i remember driving to work and I'd see the billboard. I think it opened June 6th. And, you know, we were in April and barely um, had a movie. And I thought, how are we going to do this? You know, going to work and seeing that and then having to deal with the 14 hour days was tough. But that had much more film actually than Top Gun, I think. The 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 racing in that film, there were cameras because on a racetrack, you can put them anywhere you want. And there were a lot of races filmed. Um, there was a, a, a lot of photography. There was a lot of editing to be done, a lot of music. We had Hans Zimmer on location, which is very rare to have a composer on your location. I remember I had one day off the whole movie, and that was really flying back from uh, Daytona Beach through Atlanta. Uh, so we had very little time in post, and um, it was it, that made it tough for editors that the schedule on something like that for all of us made it tough and subsequent movies that had to adhere to that schedule because we somehow made that date suffered as well. Chris, if I may ask, how would you describe the combination and the team of Don Simpson and Andre Bruckheimer? Oh no, those guys are, are brilliant. I mean, I actually learned from Don uh, some very early story sensibilities he was a studio executive a really smart guy with with story with scenes he understood what the point of a scene should be and it was driven by his sense of narrative uh, jerry was great with music and they complimented each other he was brilliant at hiring people and keeping it moving down keeping the course downfield looking out for everybody with a great overview of the movie. So I, I really enjoyed working with them. I mean, they, they deserve a lot of credit for all those early flash dance and Beverly Hills Cop, the super successful movies, Top Gun. They, they bought the article, I think, it's based on an article. Uh, and the, the studio is, really had a lot of faith in them. And Thunder, it was just, um, you know, we, we had a tough time of it. Now it's looked back. I mean, I've been on movies where studio executives have told me it's their favorite movie. So the, a lot of movies get judged 10 years from when they're released. I remember Midnight Run came out against Die Hard, got crushed at the box office. And, and now he, the last director I worked with, it was his favorite movie he's ever seen. 
and people quoted and actors talk about the improvisation and how brilliant it was. So, you know, at the time we thought, oh my God, we have a, we have a failure on our hands, but um, it's, it was, it was one of the highest Rotten Tomato scores I've ever had. I think maybe the highest. So critics have embraced it, especially in a historical perspective. Midnight Run, I think, is a terrific film. It's very entertaining. The story is told well. I think Marty Brest is a very good director. You had a great cast in there. De Niro, John Ashton. I thought it was great. Yeah, no, it was, it, it, Marty was really special. I mean, he was... He it was started at Paramount actually, and then they I think there was a parting of ways due to casting. They put it in turnaround. Universal bought it right away. These were different times, and Marty had scouted a lot of the locations anyway. So uh, the whole thing was shot on the road. I don't think there was one frame, but maybe a couple of weeks in L.A. at most. But um, there was a lot of improvising. So uh, there was a lot of editing because of it. Yeah. Uh, I was very proud of that movie. Yeah. And a great score also by Danny Elfman. Yeah, <laughs> Danny. Yeah, Danny, it's a terrific score. I would like to go back to um, to Tony Scott a little bit because you have also worked with him a couple of times. And one of the most interesting projects also in terms of editing happens to be Revenge because there are two versions the th theatrical version, and then many years later on Blu-ray, Tony Scott got the chance to release his director's cut, which is actually a good 15 minutes, if not 20 minutes shorter than the original theatrical version. I think you are the person who should know this best because I've heard many times there was conflict between Tony Scott and Ray Stark, who was one of the producers. Um, it was released through um, Raystar. The word is that the theatrical version was more Ray Stark's version, which then led to the director's cut because Tony was not happy with the original cut. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I haven't seen uh, that director's cut, um, which leads me to believe that they kind of pulled it out of what we had already done. But it was uh, there's several there there are several points to be made with that. Ray, um, in his brilliance, was uh, a very mainstream filmmaker. You know, he he did Neil Simon movies, um, and Tony had done Top Gun, but he has a very uh, deeper kind of dark side that he wanted to explore, and that of course run would run counter to anything that Ray would want to do. Uh, Tony was left alone in Mexico to shoot that film with Kevin Costner. And so he got his sense of um, depth and darkness out because it was constrained on Top Gun. It was a popcorn movie. He knew it and uh, he executed it brilliantly. So when it came to this new kind of genre for him, and it was a violent story, he he took advantage of that and ray didn't see that as the movie he wanted to make um so i think it's a fundamental problem there uh but we went through a lot of stuff in post-production trying to keep everybody happy and uh it was it, it we never did nobody was nobody was quite happy kevin even came in and i worked with him the actor uh kevin uh costner who is really fun to work with he had a kind of a bigger picture view of the movie, a grander scale. So he, his cut was longer. I don't even know what one, I mean, I was on the movie the whole time, but I'm not sure what uh, the differences in the different edits were from the one that was released. But, you know, we he, he was on board. Tony finished the movie, that's for sure. So, I mean, that's it was... Uh, it was interesting, and that's when he came back on to Days of Thunder. He went, he went back with his uh, the producers that um, he felt more comfortable with. Okay, well, the differences are actually quite striking because Tony, as by his own admission, is a director who will, who likes to keep the audience on edge, so to speak. He likes to push 
the narrative forward. And the major changes for me in the Revenge Director's Cut, obviously it, it contains more sex. I think Ray Stark was kind of reportedly uncomfortable with that. And what I found to be, well, quote unquote, distracting is the fact that Tony Scott omitted so many dialogue scenes and also which kind of described uh, Anthony Quinn's character who played Tippy and what a kind of a man he was and the short and the the short fuse that he had also when he I, I don't know if you re remember that scene when Kevin Costner gives him the jacket and then the dog comes out of nowhere and bites the jacket and Tippy takes the dog and throws him into <laughs> the pool that scene was cut other scenes um with uh, Costner and the uh, the confidant of uh, of Anthony Quinn, I think Cesar was his name. There was a lot of yeah. cuts there, so he made quite a quite a bit of change, uh, quite a few changes here to uh, well, it's like at least fifteen minutes. Yeah, I mean, I remember that moment, and that was you know we hit it with really dark Jack Nietzsche, hit it with dark music mm -hmm. to show to demonstrate the anger uh, that Anthony Quinn was capable of having. So maybe Tony didn't want to tip off his anger and just wanted to hit it hard when it happened later. I don't, I, I don't know, but yeah. that would make sense to me. Um, the same with Cesar. I remember there was a, there was a controversy between the two of them right, right when Kevin showed up. He was late, I think, or he may, he, he was late showing up, and yeah. uh, there's a kind of square off between the guys at the door, and maybe he didn't want to tip the hat of uh that controversy yet laying low because it was a really a love story um that went wrong and it's quite noted it's a quite noted uh novelette i think i hadn't i hadn't been familiar with it but it was yeah. in development for a long time too interesting though that that was his cut yeah it's, it's, it's very interesting because he also added new scenes you know which make a lot of sense and the pacing is better but i must admit i prefer the um, original cuts well it, it's always it's always hard to to judge two different versions especially if you have seen one particular version for many years and then all of a sudden there's a director's cut so it's hard to really judge and, and assess that yeah. at least that's what i think in terms of tony scott you went on to work with him a couple of more times also what two or at least two of my favorite films of the 90s crimson tide and uh, the enemy of the state and you also received an academy award nomination for crimson tide as you did for for top gun and in my book tony scott is one of the best action directors ever period what are your thoughts on tony scott and his particular style well i love i loved him um I mean, I have to say that he learned a lot. The, the more movies we did, he, he got better and better. And he always felt that was his genre uh, action. And I remember he'd always say, I don't want the audience to draw breath. Uh, he wanted to hit it hard. He had a lot of cameras. He changed his style um, halfway through his career. I think on a movie called Domino, which I didn't do, Crimson Tide was um, really, really satisfying. But I have to say it was so well written. Uh, we had different writers coming in other than the one that's credited, uh, Michael Schiffer. But Quentin Tarantino came in and wrote a scene. We had such good writers coming in. And I would show the cut and then there would be a scene that wasn't shot yet and they would write it all because of uh you know don and jerry who could and tony too that was quentin was his friend so it really helped to, and those actors were amazing i mean gene and denzel were were so good every everybody in that um well, all the actors rose to the occasion so it was it, it came together really easily the first cut was not that far off from from the from the final cut and which uh, led Hans to have a lot of time to do his brilliant score as well. It's been more than 10 years since Tony Scott passed away and I constantly revisit his films because his contributions to the world of cinema mean so much to me. Oh, that's great. I'm glad to hear you say that. 
Yeah, fantastic director. Another fantastic director whom you've worked with many, many times is Tim Burton. And one of my personal favorites of his is Batman Returns. I think that was the first time for you to work with Tim Burton, actually, in 1992. And to me, this film is one of the best comic adaptations ever. It's a fabulous one, one of the best Batman pictures ever, and one of Tim Burton's finest films. Easily top five material for, for me. That's just my two cents. And what are your thoughts and on the... Um, significance of this picture when i when i started that it was um it was a big break for me to be able to do that movie uh following in the footsteps of you know the revolutionary first batman that he did so i was so flattered and uh happy to be hired uh yet the it had a very tough release date once again um we started i can't remember some somewhere in the summer And we we had what seemed like a long time. I think we were out next Memorial Day, but the movie took a long time to shoot. And at Christmas, I showed Tim where we were in the cut. And I think there was only 50 minutes of edited material. And he was even kind of downtrodden about it right before we took a holiday break. It was great, the movie. I mean, it was it was darker and the studio, I think, had some trouble with it. And the ratings board, we ran into some issues um with fire they didn't like fire that uh during some gotham city rampage and michelle putting the stuffed animals down the garbage disposal uh mind you these were different times now they wouldn't even be brought up but those were issues back then given that it was a quote family film you know based on a comic book so we had to scale that back a bit both of those um in a big way And it had two villains, which was unusual for a movie at that time. You know, it was it's kind of a standard uh, in in cinema that you have one villain because there's one agenda and you might have a lot of heroes. But we had two villains, you know, Catwoman and uh, the Penguin, but they had different um, issues amongst themselves and their scenes together were great. Uh, but that's a tribute to Tim and, and Dan Waters. Uh, so, and the design was brilliant. I mean, I couldn't believe the sets of Bo Welsh. So all that, all that played into it as well as Danny's, you know, amazing Batman score. I don't know what the historical standards of that movie, how it's looked at, but I don't think the studio wanted Tim to do the third one. I don't think he wanted to do another one after that experience. Uh, even though if it if it, though it did make money as far as I could tell, and uh, and had had a, had a great cast and has had a long life. Yeah, for sure. And I think the um, general consensus, quote unquote, was that Warner Brothers wanted to change the tone of the franchise and go with a more family oriented picture and officially tim is credited as producer on batman forever and joel schumacher directed it i think there was some controversy over batman returns because it's pretty stiff for a family picture i mean it's pretty graphic and grim when you're in the middle of these things you don't always see the big picture you know i get dailies i and by the way we were doing nightmare before christmas at the same time um tim engaged me I had the cam, I had the editing machine. He'd come in and the the guys, Henry Selleck would come down from San Francisco with, you know, it takes a couple of weeks just to get a shot in animation back then. Um, it's stop motion is that way. So uh, we were doing that at the same time. So I, I wasn't clocking that whole dark, um, non-family version until we got more near the end a lot of his movies don't come together till more near the end of post-production when the effects are in and 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 music danny's brilliant kind of gothic feel which enhances what you're talking about that that music comes into play and then you know we color time it a little darker and the the score is is uh is is great and the mix is fun um 
but you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I you know, I can see the, the studio's point of view, I, honestly. I mean, I'm sure they wanted to turn it into a more family friendly franchise, which they did for a couple of movies. And now look at it. It's darker than ever. I think the, the, the newest one to me is darker than anything before it. You mean the Batman with a Robert, yeah. Robert Pattinson? Yeah. Yeah. And the length, the running time, you know, we were just over two hours and we're talking about with eight minutes of credits um, back on returns. And that had, like I say, two villains. It had a lot of characters in it. So it clipped along at a good pace. Um, and, and not to take anything away from the, I love the new Batman too, even though it was long, but um, the, the convention now is longer movies even though back then it was, we need more theater time. We need to get more runnings during the day and kids and families and even adults don't have the patience for two and a half hour movies. That's, that's disappeared now with success, with the, the successes of those movies. In terms of Tim Burton, I was trying to rewatch as many of his films as possible. Some of my favorites, of course, include Sleepy Hollow. I love Big Fish. Um, I just rewatched Sweeney Todd, Dumbo. There are so many sides to his films. Of course, some of them are really bleak and dark, but they are also family oriented. They contain moments of cinema magic, you know, lightheartedness. They are touching, also, especially Dumbo. It's a really heartwarming story, and Big Fish also. How do you capture the essence of his films and how do you really milk it and make sure that all of those elements are really properly presented? Well, he he's very um talent he's very talented and very instinctive. And you're right, he has a, a deep emotional uh, underpinning to his movies, uh Edward Scissorhands, which I didn't do. And all of them, really. Uh, so you and Danny enhances that uh, with his score. But he his his value for me, and even in editing, it's so fun because I'm always being surprised by what he what he's doing, and, and whether it be a particular shot, a scene, the whole movie. Um, he's he's a genius at surprising the audience, and. In fact, on Mars Attacks, I didn't even know it was a comedy until about two or three weeks into it. We weren't even sure. I don't think the crew was with me on that. We weren't quite sure what what this movie is because uh, until until the the bigger than life acting started to happen, um, and which was a pleasant surprise. But you know, I just I just dive into the material and and listen. Tim's very you know he's. We're very close. Um, I, we can probably complete each other's sentences. He doesn't have to talk a lot. And I understand what he's trying to do. You know, he's very intuitive. Uh, so it um, it's really a pleasure working on those with him. It, they go through a lot of stages. Um, the studio actually didn't like the Dumbo premiere or preview we had. We test screened it. And uh, it didn't go over well. It was very early in the process. But we like i say his movies come together very much near the end when visual effects takes over in the whole world because he does create a world that's more complete would you say that you have a big amount of leeway on his pictures i mean by the by the time you present your editor's cut do you, you feel you have to make lots of changes even towards the end or is your cut pretty much it with some fine tuning towards the end well, that with Tim, it's different. He um, his process is coming into the editing room during filming, so it's great for me as well. Even though I'm not ready for him, he'll just walk in uh, in between setups, and I'm, I'll be editing what we're shooting that day. The video tap, we call it. It comes straight from the playback camera right into the cutting room. So I'm building a scene before I have all the material, and so the effect of that over the course of the whole movie is he's seen everything and he gets a version of the movie every couple of weeks for the weekend to help him see where he is in it. And he's familiar with the cut. So it's not 
a big surprise to show a director a quote first cut when they haven't been in the the cutting room which is true with a lot of directors they're just so busy shooting they don't they're not so interested in w the process of what how the cut's going but tim's from animation so he's very particular and specific about what he wants he doesn't shoot a lot of coverage he shoots a lot of takes to get the performance the way he wants but he's very conservative with angles uh, and so it affords his dps and the crew more time to be precise and i'm sure he rehearses as well with the actors so it's a very um manageable experience from my end uh, there's always work to be done in post you never you're never done you, you know you can keep making the movie better and test screenings obviously tell you where your faults and your your assets are it's it's an evolving process his i would have to say are much easier in post-production than um but some of the commercial directors i've worked with no doubt you just mentioned Dumbo and the test screening. One of the strong points of this film were the performances and, of course, Tim Burton's storytelling and your storytelling and your input as well. And it's not just a live action version of the 40s original. So he didn't just rip it off and create a live action version. It's actually a new or quote unquote new story. And you can feel his fingerprint all over it so he is one of the most capable directors at least in my book one of the best directors for this particular project and story yeah i mean tim didn't want to make a remake of the book uh, of this cartoon um we weren't sure what we were making actually uh, but the studio was great i mean they embraced his version they gave us good notes um and you know it was very much a collaborative effort um so you know and like you said the cast was brilliant you know we'd worked with all, a lot of those actors before they were made they were part of his his um his group you know danny devito and obviously michael keaton and everybody uh, other ones in there as well so he he was he was very comfortable it was a good a great experience and I've noticed that on two of his films, you also have an executive producer credit, Alice in Wonderland and Dark Shadows. Which tasks did this job entail, additional tasks? Well, what that came to be, it's interesting, um, because on Sweeney Todd, I think it was, I engaged very much with the marketing department um, at Paramount. It was done by three, it took three studios to finance an R-rated musical, which you can understand. But I think Paramount was running a lot of the marketing, probably in collaboration with the other ones. And I remember the uh, head of marketing saying, Chris, you know, you do the job of, of an executive producer on some of these. You should think about, you know, doing that because I, I would, Tim was so busy and he was prepping something and he's, he's, He's more of uh, wait and see with what they're going to do. And so I I was providing them with information and whatnot. So I I talked to him about it and he said, yeah, no, let's do that. So that's how that came to be. And on Alice, um, we had two really good producers, uh, obviously, Dick Zanuck and Joe Roth. So I didn't have to do heavy lifting. It was really engaging with Disney and providing them what they what they needed when they needed it and uh, uh, taking meetings with them, with Dick actually, he was there, Richard, uh, with, with regard to the schedule, because it was a tight schedule. A lot of these movies have really, they have back up to release dates and they take longer to shoot for various reasons. They start late, um, so but the end date never changes. Uh, so that's how that happened and it, and it carried into Dark Shadows as well. Chris, you mentioned commercial directors. I mean, Tony Scott obviously also worked on commercials. And but Michael Bay is another one. I know that Michael Bay worked on commercials and also music videos. And if I recall correctly, you worked with Michael Bay twice. I mean, it must have been Pearl Harbor and Armageddon. That's right. 
right? And you haven't worked with them ever since. And also those two movies were also produced by by Jerry Bruckheimer. And of course, Michael Bay has often been described as a very demanding director. What do you remember about working with Michael Bay? Any story that comes to mind that you can share and you want to share, of course. You know, he was he was great, Michael. You know, one thing with him is he has the best sense of humor, I think, of of all those action directors he and and commercial directors. He really has a childlike um, sense of what's funny and what isn't, which is evident in all of his movies. Uh, certainly Armageddon, um, Pearl Harbor, there weren't that many opportunities for it, but he took advantage of it. He improvises a lot with the actors. Um, he he's he has that reputation, but he I never saw that side so much um, with him. Other than, you know, he's very particular with visual effects and uh, that he'd have all of his uh, visual effects uh, uh, vendors in one room and would be very uh, honest in his feelings about what he was looking at. And they were all competitors. Uh, so that was interesting to witness. But you know, he gets what he wants and he's an artist himself. And I, I, I've been busy to work with him. I, I can't say I wouldn't ever do it again at all. I mean, I've really admired his, his stuff. His last ambulance, I thought was terrific. His last movie. I mean, it was so complicated and so bold um, in, in its point of view and what he was doing. It's, it's like, you know, he does, he uses a dolly in the sky, you know, he can do these amazing shots and he's created these, um, these lasting images and he just, it's all, it's all, it's all phenomenal to watch from an editor's perspective. So I, um, I really, I really like watching his movies now. Yeah. I'm, I'm especially fond of his, um, early efforts. I love bad boys and the rock. I think those are some of his, some of his best and, and Armageddon, especially the first half of the film. You could see in the beginning of Armageddon, those characters were funny. Um, you know, their delivery was great. He, what he would do, Michael, at least back then, but he'd start shooting before the, before the lighting was ready, before the crew was actually ready. And he, it was just him, you know, he's, he's impatient. He was working it out in his head. And, and so the DPs didn't appreciate it, but you know, we wouldn't use early takes, uh, but, and it was, uh, it was actually helping the process. He's golden, Michael. He's one of a kind, is for sure. And I hope he can keep making movies. I kind of miss um, that he hasn't made more. And Pearl Harbor was really interesting. I think this this one had really phenomenal scenes and also great battle sequences. So I, I think editing wise, Pearl Harbor, I think wasn't wasn't a day on the beach. <laughs> no, it was tough. I mean. Um... I started the movie by myself, like I did on Armageddon. It all most of his movies have groups of editors. You know, he needs that. Uh, he's used to that. He shoots so much uh, film, and he's it, it. just keeps getting better and better. You know, our first cut on Pearl Harbor, I think, was over three hours. It was, um, and that's normal for Michael, I imagine, and it just. Uh, keeps coming down and the story gets honed but oh he was brilliant with all that battle stuff and it was in different phases you know it was um their visual effect shots we had to turn over visual effect shots way before the movie's done so we have to focus on what exactly we wanted and where it would go and he was he was he's used to that other directors couldn't probably do it really they wouldn't know what to what to give you know to hit their date but uh, that he's used to it. So he's, he knows the drill, you know, from all of his experience. Right. And speaking of long edits and long cuts, what do you think is the longest rough cut you ever had to assemble? Well, I'd probably say Pearl Harbor. Um, okay. Because it was, it was so ambitious. Um, and it was a long script anyway, and it's an epic, it was an epic movie. And there are layered characters and emotions as well uh, with a love story the the battle scenes and the 
the whole feel of it and, and the resolution, you know, it starts when the boys are kids uh, and then they're friends throughout the whole movie. And uh, it's it, so it's a layered, a multi-layered emotional movie. And so that normally would dictate the, a long, a long structure. And that's what we were dealing with. If I may ask, which film do you think was the hardest one to edit for whatever reason? Uh, they're all hard, I got to tell you, but uh, <laughs> but that's a good question. I mean, the, the, the reasons that they'd be hard is not the the editing it would or the amount of footage or what we've been talking about. It's really if uh, the story isn't working, like I say, or you don't care about the characters so much. And that's happened a couple of times. I remember there's one that the studio was so committed to making it better, thankfully. They did everything they could and they did a great job and and it spawned a sequel and maybe even another sequel was Maleficent. And that was tough because um, it, it was, it, it wasn't landing when we did it. I, I came on the first day of post to help out. Um, and uh, it took a couple of us to wrestle that movie to the ground. The studio was great in, in hiring writers to come in remember i sat with john b hancock in the cutting room who was really helpful um and he nailed it and we they did a lot of re additional photography back in the day when it wasn't so standard to do i think it was probably three weeks of it maybe even more back to london angelina was in the cutting room she had great ideas it was really a, a collaboration to wrestle that movie to what it became And um, everybody was very proud of it. Again, it made a lot of money for the studio, so they were delighted and they went off and were able to do a sequel. We previously spoke about the MPAA, or nowadays it's just the MPA. Uh, do you recall an incident or a film where it was really hard to meet their demands, you know, because they kept pushing you to um, to make certain adjustments to edit down the gore or the graphic violence of a picture um no i mean like i say batman returns because i mean we're talking 91 there and and, and um standards have changed a great deal um and they did you know we, you can't have fire in a scene with villains running around when the music is actually overly comical it was it was kind of hard for tim to handle that as well as you know like i say um michelle putting down the garbage disposal her her stuffed animals i mean you wouldn't think that would alarm the mpa but it was like you said like you alluded to earlier that was a family fair movie with batman um in a franchise so that was particularly vulnerable to mpaa scrutiny But they're usually pretty good now and it's not hard to tone down the violence on a movie for me and i think um it's only when studios want the pg-13 rating that you have to be careful and it's mostly language i think now um and so i haven't i've been lucky i haven't had too much trouble revenge which was very violent we didn't have but that was an r-rated movie when you get when you just dictate that it's going to be r you're you're pretty golden um it's on the more of the the franchises that have to be careful uh, because you know they're expected to have larger audiences and a wide range of younger viewers Thank you. And you just mentioned the fact that you had to work with or that you were given the chance to work with so many different directors. And needless to say, this also means that you kind of have to mash your personality with theirs. And also, let's say Dexter Fletcher, a recent example, um, Ghosted, which is now available on, on Apple TV. So how do you mash your personality with theirs? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm a good listener. I like to think, uh, cause, and I take in what I feel is the essence of their personality and it's their movie. Their careers are much more at stake than mine. I can go and edit another movie, but, um, 
these guys can go to movie jail for 10 years if they do something that doesn't connect a big budget movie. Um, in the case of Dexter, it was great for me because he was a child actor. And, you know, I learned something on every movie and he engaged the actors in such an original way and they all loved him. He'd improvised. He let them improvise a great deal. He was the guy who thought Midnight Run was his favorite movie probably because of the improvisation maybe that's why he hired me to come on but my point being he's he's from a different he's from a different world i mean he was in band of brothers he was in my he was uh, in that movie revolution he was al pacino's son you know he was a child actor he was in lock stock and barrel he goes way back and uh, was in the shakespeare company uh when he was very young so he has a whole different view of of editing it's not angles and this and pace and that it's really character um and that shines through in that movie uh, and i had never done so much of a romantic comedy or at least that what feels like that initially and then takes a, a really pleasant turn into the world of of action and is a it's a different take on a character from chris evans who she, is captain america so he was he was he was he basically played the female um vulnerable character in it and Anna de Armas was the strong hero so it was a, it was a nice twist that worked really well I enjoyed it thoroughly but to answer your question it's really I just put myself in their shoes and try and do the best I can to to help them get to where they're going and you know I'll give them ideas I'll do cuts on the side I'll advise the best I can but it's ultimately up to up to them what movie they present to the studio, and then it becomes a collaborative effort with all of us. Who do you think shot the most amount of film or footage in general? Well, probably Joe Kaczynski on Top Gun Maverick, but that's because he he had to. You know, there was uh, there were certain scenes that were um, rephotographed to make them better. And the he could with all of his digital cameras uh, these days with the aerial photography, but other than that, Michael Bay consistently somebody I've worked with uh, on a longer term basis would would be that guy for sure with his with his different cameras, uh, th four cameras going in a scene, you know, with a couple of people in a room, um, and, but always 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 surprises. Uh, and Tony, Tony was doing that too, but I think Michael probably takes the cake there. And you, you just mentioned Top Gun Maverick. Yes, you were an additional editor or consulting editor on this one, right? Yeah, additional editor uh, on it, on it, which was um, a lot of fun for me. Very emotional to go back and live in that world for the the months that I was on it. I must admit that at first I was a bit surprised to learn that they were gonna make a sequel to Top Gun after all because as I understand it was in the works and, and then they kind of dismissed discarded the idea again and then all of a sudden it was back on and I felt I was a bit lukewarm uh, I, I must admit but I thought it was a phenomenal sequel it was really good really good yeah no I well uh, you're right I mean they had Tony was talking about it for a long time and they'd been trying to make it. Tom was spearheading that. And he had a great relationship with Paramount with his mission franchise. And um, Joe had a take on it, I think, and pitched it and pitched it to Tom because he had worked with Tom on a prior movie. And whatever that was, this it worked. And Tom was on top of his game and could secure the financing with the studio and uh, then you know just sailed off from there um but no it was it was it was very satisfying sequel i'm so happy for for everyone involved in that that it it kind of brought back the audience to the theaters yeah and it made quite a bit of money 1.1.5 billion or 1.8 billion dollars so far that's huge yeah, no, um, anytime a movie makes money, whether I'm on it or not, I'm happy because it's good yeah. for all of us. <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And I think there was so much nostalgia involved with Top Gun 
that people kind of flock to the cinema. And I mean, I, I, I was curious too, obviously, even though I didn't know what to make of it at first, but then I was so pleasantly surprised. Yeah, no, that's a really a tribute to the, you know, the director and Chris McCory, uh, Tom's partner, Tom himself and Jerry Bruckheimer. And, you know, Eddie Hamilton did a great job uh, with the editing the entire time. Terrific director of photography. I mean, all the, the technical credits were super and the acting was great. You know, the casting, all those, all the pilots, it's much more complicated movie and it was a visual effects movie. And Joe Kaczynski is so good in that world um, that that's, that's why that, that movie, it connected on all fronts. Chris, do you actually revisit your movies from time to time? Well, I try not to. Lately I've had to go over to Paramount and remaster some of the, Tim Burton movies. I think I did Sweeney Todd and uh, what else? Oh, there was uh, uh, Sleepy Hollow. And it's it's really an interesting, it brings me back to the time that I was living at, uh, in that. You know, I think of my life as charted not with vacations or events that happened, but more with what movie I was on then. So um, that, 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 brings back really a lot of memories and in the cases sleepy hollow I actually thought there were areas I could cut a little more out of but okay. that's just me uh and I thought because you know it's a different sensibilities now I think although the movie turned out really good and it was a lot of fun to go back and study it and re recolor it um but I try not to really look at some of them they bring back a, a flood of memories i'd rather uh, you know in, in, as wayne gretzky says he goes where the he he skates where the puck is going not where it's been so i kind of i kind of look at it to the future more and i'm thankful for anything that has happened to me in the past chris thank you very much for taking so much time out of your schedule i really appreciate that I had a great time talking to you and I hope you enjoyed the conversation as well. I did and you were great. You, you had great insights into what we do. Thanks so much.